that out. We'd appreciate that. And there's a box back there in the back, or you can just hand it to one of the members and it'll get to the right place. Um, our first song this morning is number B49. It's in our folders, B49, if you want to take an opportunity to turn to that. We do ask as we begin our worship this morning that you would uh, silence your cell phones or any noisemakers so that you won't bother those who are around you. I want to make sure that uh, I know all the members have their little handout. Just be aware of those people that we continue to pray for that are, are sick. Um, we do learn that Hewlin is back at home. We're proud, proud of that. We want to pray for her and Annette as she continues to take care of him. Continue to pray for Paul and Joanne with their medical problems. Uh, and um, also um, uh, Harold Mobley, he's here with us this morning, but is having some additional medical problems, so keep him in our prayers and all those that are listed on our prayer sheet. I'll have other announcements after worship, so let's, uh, let's begin with, with prayer. Oh, gracious Father, we are grateful for the day, Father. Father, we always look forward to the first day of the week in which we can come and bow before you and praise you and honor you in our worship, Father. So we pray this morning, as we sing songs of praise, Father, as we listen to your word, that we would, that our minds will be focused on you and your son alone. Father, we're grateful for the sacrifice your, you and your son made for us so that we have the opportunity to honor you and praise you and also have the opportunity for eternal life. So, Father, this morning, help us as we worship you that our minds will be focused as they should be. Father, we're grateful for you as the great physician, and, Father, we ask that you would be with all those that I've just mentioned who are having health issues. Be with them and help them to... Uh, be able to get uh, better is our prayer, prayer, Father. Father, uh, we do often do those things that are contrary to your will. We ask forgiveness for those. So, Father, as we begin to worship, help, help, help our minds to be, again, focused on you. As I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. B49. Oh God, you are my God, and I will ever praise you.
on before our scripture reading prayer we'll sing b33 be in your folder folders b33 chosen the scripture this morning to come from 2 Timothy chapter 3 verses 15 through 17. That's 2 Timothy chapter 3 verses 15 through 17. 
and is read, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All scriptures is given by inspirations of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. I have just read Second Timothy chapter three, verses fifteen through seventeen. Let us pray. Most gracious and wonderful Father, we thank you, O Heavenly Father, this morning for giving each and every one of us the opportunity, O Heavenly Father, to come out this morning to worship you in spirit and in truth. We pray, O Heavenly Father, for the sick. We pray, O Heavenly Father, that you will help aid and assist them, whether it's physical or mental, with whatever problem they have this mo- at this time this morning, O Heavenly Father. We continue to pray for the bereaved families, O Heavenly Father. We pray that you will be with them as they go through the lost of family and in friends. We pray, O Heavenly Father, that you continue to build them up. We pray, O Heavenly Father, overhead here. Brother Gary and his family, El and the Dickens and their family. We pray, O Heavenly Father, that you will continue. You give our leadership here the ability to do thy will. We pray, O Heavenly Father, for our elected officials as we go through this COVID-19 pandemic. We pray, O Heavenly Father, that they, as we take vaccination, that they will be beneficial in saving lives. We pray, O Heavenly Father, this morning, for traveling grace that we will make it to those places far and near safe and sound. We pray, O Heavenly Father, as we go through the service this morning, that it will be pleasing and acceptable in our sight. We thank you, O Heavenly Father, for your son Jesus that died on the cross for we have a chance to the tree of life. Forgive us, O Heavenly Father, of our shortcoming if it be our will. This is our prayer. We ask you to pray in the name of your son Jesus. Amen. If you're using a songbook and like to mark an invitation song, it be number 702. 702. That would be invitation song. And before our lesson this morning, we'll sing number 488. 488. You find it convenient, let us stand. 488. Standing on the promises of Christ, my
Please be seated. Good morning. It is always a joy to be together like we are right now. Some, of course, are with us online, and we're, we're thankful they're able to do that. That's, that's a blessing when you cannot get uh, out of the house for whatever the reason might be. But for those that are here, we're sure glad you're here. We've got several in our audience today who are uh, visiting with us. We're thankful for you being here. And we're going to make every effort to make you feel welcome. You've already gotten one wel welcome from Andy. I'm adding mine uh, to that. And I'm going to say, from my experience, if you get out of here without being spoken to, you're shoving people out of the way. <laughs> because we're going to try to talk to you and let you know that we appreciate you being with us. All right. If you do not have a green book, uh, either one... You never got one or two, you've lost the one that you were given uh, or didn't bring it today. And if you need one uh, to follow along, please let us know. Raise your hand. I've got people positioned. There's one back there, one right there, one right there. Oh, one here. Walk back there and grab you one. I, I know you, it's right back on, there he comes, here he comes, good deal. Got some on this back row over here, Derek. All right. Well, this coat's going to be too much, so good. You all get your books and I'm getting rid of a coat. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so what we're doing here is we're going through a series of books called Back to the Bible. There are three of them. I went, believe it or not, relatively slowly last week as we covered the first book. I divided it in two. You'll notice as we go along, we get a little bit further on in this presentation, that we're on down into the book. Look for the headings and you'll figure it out from there. It's not difficult. The scripture reading today was for a reason. I want you to think about the scripture reading that we had. 2 Timothy chapter 3, uh, verses uh, 15 through 17. I want you to zero in on verse 15 for just a minute. That from a child, or that from childhood. Let me suggest something to all of you. I didn't say it well last week, and I really appreciate Owen pointing this out to me in a very kind way. I'll add. Uh, you're not really the teacher. If you look at these books, you're a guide. Your purpose is to guide someone through the Word of God. Your purpose is to be quiet and let them figure out what the Scripture says. If a child can understand it, I figure most of us adults can too. Now, we may be a little slower than the child, but we'll pick up on it. We'll get it. Now, here are some instructions. I, we did this last week. We're going to do it again this week. And that is this. Please read the Scriptures aloud, and then we'll answer the questions under the Scripture references. You're going to observe today, as we did last week, that if you read these aloud, the answers are pretty much obvious. Anybody can figure it out. I, I'm going to dare say that you're not going to have a difficulty with somebody understanding it. Uh, they'll be able to fill in the blanks. And may it come to the end and for want, want to disagree with something? Well, that's a different, different story, different day. But, but I think they're going to understand very well. I'm going to remind you, deflect all, all questions, except maybe the understanding of a particular question, deflect all questions until you're totally through the study, all three books. Why? Because most things are going to be answered as you go through these three books. Now, Lord willing, next week we're going to cover all of book two. So, you know, buckle your seatbelts next week and we'll move even faster uh, than we have so far. But let's, let's go forward. What did we learn last week? Look, at, look at, what, at what is before you there. We learned, first of all, that all truth comes from God the Father. That God the Father gave that truth to God the Son 
that God the Son gave that truth to God the Holy Spirit, that God the Holy Spirit gave that truth to the apostles, and that the apostles wrote it down in the Bible. That's what we learned last week. We used a lot of Scripture to do that, but that was the primary force of what we were looking at last week. Now we want to observe that we must not add to or take away from God's Word. In Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 2, we find Moses writing this, You shall not add to the Word which I command you, nor take from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I command you. And then there is the question, and the question is, would we please God if we added to or deleted anything from His Word? What's the obvious answer? No, we wouldn't please God. He would not be happy if we added to or deleted something from His Word. I'm kind of reminded of the woman that preacher got up and preached, and he, he delivered a passage that obviously she must not have agreed with. And uh, she came out at the end of the lesson. She said, Preacher, that, that verse not in my Bible. And he said, uh, I, Ma'am, I, I, I beg to differ with you. It, it is in your Bible. Uh, and she said, No, it's not. It's not in my Bible. And he said, well, would you mind showing me your Bible? And she said, sure will. And she handed him his Bible, and he opened up to the page, and she cut it out. It wasn't in her Bible. <laughs> okay, well, God doesn't want us to cut something out. That's pretty obvious, isn't it? And if we do that, we're not going to please Him. Look at Galatians chapter 1, verses 6-9. through 9. I marvel that you're turning away so soon from Him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another. But there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel to you than, that, than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. As we've said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you, then what, we, what you have received, let him be accursed. And then we have the question. And the question is, will we be accursed if we add to or take away from the Bible? And again, the answer is easy, isn't it? Yes, we will be accursed. So we don't want to do that. We want to avoid that. Leviticus chapter 10, verses 1 and 2. Here's an actual pair of men uh, who were supposed to be serving God, but they didn't do His will. Look what happens. Then Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer and put fire in it, put incense on it, and offered profane fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. So fire went out from the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. Now, just for a little bit of background here, uh, Nadab and Abihu are sons of Aaron. They serve God as a priest in the tabernacle. And they have directions for how they're supposed to do that. So the question is, these men offered strange, that's King James. New King James has profane. By the way, some translations, English Standard, for example, have uh, unacceptable uh, I believe, in that particular place, uh, fire before the Lord, which, what? You see what's in red there? He had not commanded them. So the answer is, they did something He didn't command, right? He had not commanded them. Now, we have some follow-up questions. The follow-up questions. Number one, did they alter God's commandment? Yes, they altered God's commandment. Was God pleased with them? Well, I'd say the fire out of heaven would say no. What do you think? I think that's pretty obvious. Must we then be careful how we handle the Word of God? <laughs> Duh, of course. Yes, we've got to be careful about it uh, because we can see what God thinks if we do something differently. Book of 2 John, verse 9. John writes this. Whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. 
He who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. And so then we have this question. If we do not abide in the doctrine of Christ, is God pleased? That's easy. We all would say no. Now you'll notice up here on the screen, I didn't answer the next question. It's not because I don't know the answer for me. It's because I don't know the answer for you. And if you're going through the booklets with somebody, don't answer this question for them. They need to answer this question. And the question is, do you want to please God? Now the desirable answer is what? Yes, I want to please God. Uh, and that ought to be all of our answer. But you've got to let the individual come to that on their own. That's got to be the way that they uh, think in their minds. All right, look at another verse. Matthew chapter 15, verse 9. Jesus says, And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commands of men. Now, wait a minute. What does the word vain here mean? Probably for me, if I substitute in my mind the word empty, uh, worthless, that's the idea that we're talking about here. So what's the question? Their worship to God was unacceptable because they taught for doctrines, what? Well, the commandments of men. That's what we saw in that passage. And that was, in Jesus' eyes, not acceptable. Look at another verse. This is the end of the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Now, pause just a minute and let me observe something. There are many people who believe that all they have to do in order to be saved is call on the name of the Lord. What did Jesus think about that? Let's... Let's look at the question. Who will not be allowed to enter heaven? And the answer from the text is, the one who does, uh, or who will, excuse me, I ask again, who will be allowed to enter heaven? The one who does the will of Jesus' Father in heaven. Now again, I didn't answer the next question. It's not because I don't know the answer for me. I want to go to heaven. But when, you, when you're studying with someone, you just simply say, do you want to go to heaven? I, I've never had anybody say no. Now, I'm sure I'm going to bump into one one of these days, but I haven't had that happen yet. And so let them answer the question. Now we also want to ask the question, we are under which law? There's a lot of confusion about this. There's some people that believe they're still under the law of Moses. So let's think about that, looking at it scripturally speaking. Look at Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1, beginning at verse 1. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken unto us by His Son, whom He has appointed heir of all things, through whom also He made the world. All right, let's look at the question. God formerly gave His revelations to the fathers by the prophets, right? Isn't that what it says? Gave it by the prophets. That's verse 1. But today He speaks to us through His, this is verse 2, His Son, right? His Son. So Jesus Christ is God's spokesman for today. All right? Matthew 28, verse 18. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Okay, the question. How much authority did God give Jesus? Now, look. See the word all is highlighted in red? How much authority did God give him? Gave him all authority. That's what we saw in that passage. Look at John chapter 12. Now, Jesus at this point is explaining to the Jews and those who are listening to his teaching what they're going to confront when they get to the judgment day. I would think I'd want to know that, wouldn't you? If I was having a test, I'd want to know what's going to be on the test. And I'd want to be prepared for it. So this is kind of a test in the judgment day. 
John 12, 48, He who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. So, what's the question? We will be judged by the words of well, Jesus, right? That's what he said. You're going to be judged by the words of Jesus. Look at John chapter 1, verse 17. This, of course, is uh, the, as it were, the introductory things that uh, the Apostle John put in his gospel record. And here's a part of what he said. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So the question, the law was given by, all of us figured that out, Moses, right? That's what he says. Moses. Grace and truth came by, well, he says Jesus Christ, doesn't he? So the answer is Jesus Christ. Look at Hebrews chapter 9, beginning at verse 15. And for this reason, he is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant, that those who are called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. For where there is a testament, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is in force after men are dead, since it has no power at all while the testator lives. All right, the question is, is Jesus the mediator of the New Testament? Well, the passage is pretty clear, isn't it? He is the mediator of the New Covenant, or Testament. And so the answer is yes, he is. Here's the second question. When did the New Testament of Jesus go into effect? Now, what's the answer from the Scripture? At Jesus' death. By the way, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but if you've got a will, do you expect your children to come calling and say, you know, in the will it says I get, I get this table you're eating off of. I'm, I'm here to pick it up. I don't expect that to happen. You know, wait till I die. You know, you, some people don't wait till they get in the grave, but, but at least wait till I'm dead before you take my table. You know? Even if it is in the will, going to you. All right, Hebrews chapter 8, verses 6 and 7. But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry, inasmuch as he is also mediator of a better covenant, which was established on better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for a second. So, first question. Is... Is Jesus the mediator of a better covenant? The text says yes, doesn't it? It says exactly that. If that first covenant, that would be the Old Testament, had been faultless, would God have given us the second covenant or the New Testament? And the answer is no. If the first covenant had done all that needed to be done, there'd been no need for a second covenant. And you know, uh, God doesn't do things unnecessarily. He always does what's needful. So, look at Hebrews chapter 8, verse 13. In that, he says, a new covenant, he has made the first obsolete. Now, what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. All right, so here's the question. When God gave the new covenant, did he make the first one old or no longer in force? What's the answer? Yes, he made it old and no longer in force. Now that, by the way, it doesn't make it unuseful. It's useful for teaching. We look at Romans 15, uh, verse 4 and 1 Corinthians chapter 10, both of those clearly say the Old Testament's useful for teaching, but we're not under it. It's not the law under which we serve. So, Acts chapter 13, verses 38 and 39. Here's Paul in Antioch of Pisidia. What does he say? Therefore, let it be known to you, brethren, that through this man is preached to you the forgiveness of sins, and by him... 
Everyone who believes is justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. So the question, can we be justified by the law of Moses? What did the, what did the Apostle Paul say? He said, no. No, you cannot be justified by the law of Moses. Look again. Galatians chapter 3, verses 11 through 13. But that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident. For the just shall live by faith. Yet the law is not of faith, but the, but the man who does them shall live by them. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Now, let me pause just a minute. This is a difficult passage for some to understand. When he, listen to him again, he says the law is not of faith. Why not? Because it's a works-oriented law. Because it's a law that says, you do this, and you're going to get my reward. You don't do this, you're going to get punished. That's all it says. There's no faith in that. That's just tick it off. You know, it's kind of like having a checklist. And you do whatever it says, you're going to heaven. Guess what? Nobody could do that. Only one man ever did that. That's Jesus Christ. And everybody else was condemned because they did not perfectly satisfy the law. That's why God had to do away with it. So, the question, is the law of faith? Well, now you know the answer, right? No. Paul said it, not of faith. All right, follow-up question. Did Christ redeem us from the curse of the law? What did Paul say? He said, yes. He redeemed us from the curse of the law. All right, look at Colossians chapter 2. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 14, Paul, writing to those brethren of the church of Colossae, says, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Okay, the question, when was the bond written in ordinances abolished? What did Paul say? He said, when Jesus was nailed to the cross. That's when it was taken out of the way. Look at Ephesians chapter 2. In Ephesians, particularly in chapter 2, Paul's talking about how everybody is saved, both Jew and Gentile. And he's explaining ultimately that it's in Jesus Christ. Here's part of what he wrote, verse 15. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is, the law of commandments, contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace. All right, so what did Jesus abolish in his flesh? And the answer, according to this passage, see what's highlighted in red? The law of commandments. What is the Ten Commandments? It's the law of commandments. And so what did Jesus abolish? The Ten Commandments. Look at Galatians chapter 3, beginning verse 23. But before faith came, we were kept under guard by the law, kept for the faith which would afterward be revealed. Therefore, the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. But after faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. Now, a tutor in the days of Paul was a servant who took the children from the house to the schoolhouse. That was the servant's job. When the servant arrived at the schoolhouse, there was a specific law. The servant couldn't go into the school. Okay, so what was the law of Moses? It was the servant to lead us to the schoolhouse, if you would. So, here's the question. Now that faith has come, are we under the law? And you know the answer to that's no, and the reason why is servant's not allowed to enter. And the law of Moses is just a servant. It's not the son. Look at Romans chapter 7. In Romans 7, Paul uses a comparison we can understand. He uses marriage 
And how long is a man uh, bound to his wife? Or how long is a woman bound to her husband? The answer is easy. Till they die. So listen to what he says. Therefore, my brethren, you also have become dead to the law through the body of Christ, that you may be married to another, to him who was raised from the dead, that we should bear fruit to God. So the question, Paul says, you or ye also are become what? Dead to the law by the body of Christ. So in Christ, we've died to the law. Romans chapter 7, same chapter. Go down two verses. Verse 6. But now, we've been delivered from the law, having died to what we were held by, so that we should serve in the newness of the Spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. So the question is, uh, Paul says, now we are what? Delivered from the law. And so then comes the big question for this part of the study. Is the New Testament, the law, spiritually binding today? What have we, come to, what have we seen in all that we've studied? It is the binding law, isn't it? It is what we must follow, the New Testament. So, what have we learned? Now we're going to look at the whole thing. We learn that all truth came from God the Father. That God the Father gave all truth to the Son. That the Son gave all truth to the Holy Spirit. That the Holy Spirit gave all truth to the apostles and their generation. That the apostles wrote it down in the Bible, but particularly, where did they write it? In the New Testament. So let's summarize everything that we've learned in this entire book, this first green book. In this lesson, we have learned, number one, the teaching of Jesus was from God. He never claimed anything else. You want to read an interesting thing? Read the book of John and underline every time Jesus says, I came to do. Whose will did He come to do? The Father's. Whose word did He come to deliver? The fathers. Over and over again, that's his emphasis. That's his whole purpose in life. So number two, Jesus received all authority from God. Where? Number one, in heaven and on earth. Number two, over all flesh. Number three, over the church. By the way, who's, who's in charge of the church? Let's talk about it right here. Who's really in charge of the church? God is. It's wonderful that we've got good leaders. I pray for them every day, but let's be honest about it. If they ever quit following God, then I'm going with God. <laughs> you know, because he's, he's the real leader. Jesus is the real leader. Number three, we will be judged by the teachings of Jesus. We've seen that, haven't we, as we've gone through this. Number four, the apostles were inspired by the Holy Spirit in what they taught and wrote. The New Testament is the Word of God. Why? Because they were inspired to speak it. They were inspired to talk about it. Number five, the inspired word is our only guide in religion. You want an answer to religious questions, you don't get it from mom and dad. You don't get it from your preacher. You don't get it from any human being unless they turn to what? The Bible. Because the Bible has it. The Bible tells us what we need to know. It is the guide in religion. Number six, we must not add to or take away from God's Word. And number seven, the New Testament is the law which we are under and by which we will be judged. So I've got a simple question for all of us today. Since the New Testament is the law by which we are judged, what does it tell us we must do in order to be saved? Think Acts chapter 2, verse 38, because the people on that day asked that very question, didn't they? Acts chapter 2, verse 37, men and brethren, what shall we do? And what answer does Peter give? By inspiration, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. I want all of us to... Zero in on that verse and look at it carefully. 
When does Peter say we, our sins are remitted? After we repent and are baptized. It's clear in that passage. Very clear. That that's what we must do in order to be saved. If you're not there yet, if you've not done that yet, here's the good news. You can see it in the law of God. And if it says that and you're ready to do it, why don't you come while we sing? First, we need to um, keep in our prayers with Brother Lynn Birch. Uh, he uh, wanted to work under the oversight of the elders here at Sawwell Road. Brother Lynn, would you raise your hand again? There you go. Uh, he also, while meeting with the elders, uh, said that he had certainly in the past not lived like he should and wanted forgiveness of that, so we want to have a prayer for him. Also, I was handed a... <clears throat> A, a card from Colin Middleton this morning. It says, "This past Wednesday night, I lost my temper, and the uh, and the congregation saw an outburst that was unbecoming member, uh, unbecoming of a member of the body of Christ." I'm aware of the potential damage that my actions could have toward the work of the kingdom, and I hope the congregation can f forgive my actions. I ask for prayers as I continue to learn to control my emotions in Christian love, Colin Middleton. So we want to have a prayer for Brother Lynn and Brother Colin. If you would bow with me. <clears throat> Father, we uh, at times fall short of your expectations. All of us do, Father, and we 
are just thankful that you provide a way back to you, Father, a way that we can get forgiveness for those things. And Father, you've shown us that if we confess our sins, you will forgive us. So we do ask uh, for Brother Lynn. Uh, Father, he's confessed that he has not lived like he should in the past and wants to rectify that and make it right. And so, Father, we're grateful for that, and we're grateful for your blood that washes those sins away. And, Father, we ask on behalf of Colin that you would uh, help him in times of uh, times in which he may want to lose control. And, Father, we know that all of us at times have times like that, so we ask that you'd help us to be able to control our anger and outburst as we uh, are around each other, Father, and in every situation. Father, it's always good for us to uh, recognize and help us to recognize uh, that we are uh, those that are representing you in all of our actions. So, Father, we do ask that you would uh, forgive Colin and help us to help him and help Lynn to be better uh, servants of yours. Father, help us to encourage and help each other, all of us, to help each other to to be better servants so that we can all go to heaven together. Uh, Father, again, we're grateful for this time. We're grateful for the opportunity that we can talk to you about each other's needs and help us as we uh, continue to uh, confess sins to you and forgive each other. Father, we love you and thank you for your son that provided the blood that surely washes our sins away. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. As we direct our thoughts towards the Lord's Supper, let's sing number 449. 449. We'll sing all five verses. 449. Man of sorrows, Reading from Romans 
chapter 6, verses 16 through 18. Romans chapter 6, verses 16 through 18. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness? But thanks be to God that we, that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching which you were committed. And having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. Through Jesus' Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, we have been freed from sin and death. Would you pray with me? Father, we're so thankful for the love that you have for us, that you sent your Son down to this earth to live a perfect life and to be nailed to that cross and to bear our sins. Father, as we partake of this bread, help us think back to his body and the suffering that he gave for us. In Jesus' name, amen. And will you pray with me? Father, we're so thankful for the blood that was shed that washes away the sin from our lives and gives us that hope of eternal life to be with you. And Father, as we partake of this through the vine that represents that blood, let's think back to what was done for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Includes the Lord's Supper. <clears throat> Before we have our uh, prayer for the giving and our closing prayer and, and song, a few more announcements. Um, as I said, there are a number on our prayer list that we need to continue to keep in prayers. Um, I do want to mention uh, uh, Kevin and Taryn Terry again. Uh, this is uh, their niece drowned this last week. Uh, they're the uh, neighbors of Jeff and Katie Seal. And I mention them only because, you know, we're trying to start kind of sending cards to those that are in need to show our care for them. So if you would like to send a card, please see Derek or contact the church office for their address. A men's fellowship meeting will be uh, July 12th at 630. That's Tuesday, Monday, tomorrow, tomorrow night, tomorrow night. Uh, also, uh, a door knock. Door knocking will be on July 31st at 9, uh, 9 a.m. Uh, Colin hand me uh, a thank you card uh, from the Jordans that we sent uh, uh, cards to. Uh, so uh, we did receive that. And it's, it's good to see a response like that. And hopefully um, we can do something to maybe uh, bring them to worship with us and those type things. So we appreciate all those who delivered cards for them. Also, Colin handed me um, a Discovery Magazine, uh, which is good for our kids, particularly, I don't know, ages probably when you start reading four and five and six and, and on up. 
uh, he has copies of those with him or there in the foyer. So please, if you have children that might take and use that and read about a lot of good information, biblical information in that, in that magazine. So take advantage of that. If you would, please stand and we'll have our closing song and closing prayer. The closing song will be number 350. 350, sing the first and last verse. 350. I'm satisfied with just what we love. is in the back where you can leave your contribution, you can mail it in, or you can give on the realm out. Would you pray with me? Father, we're so thankful for this time we can gather as your church and sing praises to your name and to worship you and to hear a portion of your word. And Father, as we have these studies of these lessons, help us to Look for opportunities and make opportunities to share that with others so that they will have eternal life. Father, as we leave this place, we ask you to be with us and watch over us and bring us back. In Jesus' name, amen.